Well, good, good morning, everyone. Are we on? I can't tell. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and to share the stage with this uh, distinguished group. Uh, as we said this morning, we'll be focusing on some historical efforts, looking at lessons learned, and then strategies for the future. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion this morning from Assistant Secretary uh, Jim McDonald on countering weapons of mass destruction and how his agency is now taking the lead what, from what was historically a, a nuclear mission uh, to try and coalesce this into a, a broader program. And along the way, we've had the opportunity to, to work through a number of issues. Uh, we had a model that uh, I think he was working on and that Dr. Guadia um, brought to the forefront a number of years ago and has been working towards where we are today. So what we'd like to do is talk a little bit, one, about the lessons learned and how we can take advantage of those uh, for our future activities. So before we get started, um, I'd just like the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Kerry Robinson. I'm with Noblis. I lead the, uh, the RAD nuke thrust area within our uh, defense and homeland security area. Uh, primarily, uh, our focus is uh, supporting the homeland security division, um, sorry, homeland security. Uh, and we provide subject matter expertise to a number of the agencies and try to, to make sure that uh, we're providing the best direction we can for our, our clients moving forward. Um, we'll go down. I'd like to start with uh, Amanda Richardson, please. Sure. And I'm Amanda Richardson. Um, as has been noted, I work at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. I have actually come through there as a technical program manager in our ChemBio Defense program and now work at the research and development portfolio level. So I'm the chief of R&D operations there. Prior to going to DITRA, I did work for the National Nuclear Security Administration for a while and worked on Capitol Hill before that. I come from a technical and policy background, so have blended those things together in DITRA. All right, I'm uh, Thay Mermain. I do not come from a policy background uh, or some of the same background, but I have worked with Amanda up until about a month ago. Um, she was in the higher headquarters and I was working in the ChemBio uh, Science and Technology Office at, at uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency as well. Uh, just you've, you've probably seen the bio. I spent a lot of time with soldiers. I had advice as a young officer, stay as low as you can for as long as you can. If you're a lieutenant, be in a platoon. That's where you want to be. If you're a captain, be with your troops at, at a company. So I tried to do that until I realized that I was really missing out because the things that get done for our soldiers get done through bigger processes and how the Army runs and some of those things, so I had to hurry up and try to learn learn some of those things. Uh, so I've spent some time in the requirements world. I'm happy to talk about anything about JSIDs and requirements and, and, and what's not right with that and what we can do better. I'm happy to talk about that uh, and the Chem Bio Defense Program in general. Uh, right now, I'm obviously, uh, I was Dr. Hand's deputy for the last year, and now I'm Dr. Hassel's uh, deputy at the, at the DASD's office. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Huban Gawadia. I'm presently uh, uh, the Deputy Principal Associate Director at the Niffin Photon Science Directorate at Lawrence Livermore, which is to say I work with a bunch of really, really smart laser physicists doing things I absolutely know nothing about. Um, <laughs> that having been said, I spent uh, the vast majority of my uh, adult life uh, supporting national security and homeland security missions uh, on 9-11. I was uh, airport checkpoint program manager, and as you can imagine, that's uh, kind of shaped everything I've done for national service ever since. Um, stood up TSA and DOT, uh, was asked to come over and stand up S&T at DHS. Um, the NDO stood up, Vale, you heard mentioned, asked me to come up and help him stand up the NDO, so that was uh, my time as a startup specialist, and then uh, took the NDO to a Pretty steady state for a little while, uh, winding up as director, and then went back to my roots, which is really the uh, the thing I, I think I know the most about, but I've spent the least time doing, which is explosives work. And I wound up as a deputy administrator at TSA, and through the transition as acting administrator, uh, looking through that. So if you hate anybody for that whole laptop ban, <laughs> if you hate anybody for taking your shoes off, <laughs> so that was the back end of my career at TSA and the front end of my career at TSA. So, um, but that having been said, this is a community that uh, I always enjoy coming back to and this has been such a significant homecoming for me and quite a reunion. So thank you to Noblis for, for putting this together and for giving me the opportunity to reminisce a bit. Well, thank you all. So we have uh, a rather varied 
um, panel here today. We have uh, former DNDO, so former at the pointy end of the stick for uh, nuke detection and, and uh, nuke work. We have DITRA, um, some say the behemoth in the R&D world for DOD, but uh, and where I think, as Jim said, maybe CWMD aspires to be is the, uh, the DITRA for DHS. Um, and we have DOD represented here. So one of the things we've seen is uh, in the past, the areas of CWMD, ChemBio, RADNUC, have been stovepipes of excellence, if you will, where different agencies have taken the lead for these. Um, we've seen some successes through the nuclear program. I think uh, Jim held that up as, as sort of the um, paragon of where, where we'd like to be um, for our detection architecture. Um, but how, how do we take those lessons learned um, and I'll even throw requirements in, Colonel, because I think that's one of the important things. But how do we take that and coalesce this into a, a comprehensive program um, that, that we can see a great success in as we move forward here? Can we take the first crack at that one? Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's a softball. So. Okay, so um, there's a couple ways to approach it, and none of them are better than relationships right now, uh, I, I think. Uh, so you can do, you can design the grand policy and memorandums of agreement and understanding and unity of effort councils and those are all really good things, but none of it works without with it, without the relationships uh, and without being transparent and sharing what it is we're doing, and being able to communicate what it is we need to be able to achieve the effects we're trying to achieve. So why are you trying to even build something? Well, it's because we need to know something without having to put a soldier there. Oh, that's you know. Being able to communicate that, but I really think the success is, is going to be on relationships, not uh, not documents right now. And I'd agree with that. As you heard us introduce ourselves and you heard Thamer and I were working together until a month ago, and my current boss used to work with Haban, and a lot of folks who have worked at DITRA have gone to work at DHS and vice versa, the same with DOE. It really is a community, and I think that those relationships are what we're leaning upon now as we're trying to find more integrated solutions for things because we found as we've gone along that we can work on something in isolation, but when there is an event, we have to be more coordinated. Or even in a resource-constrained environment, we've gone through sequestration, Budget Control Act, things like that. We have to find ways to work together to better leverage the resources at hand so that we can achieve this massive mission that we're trying to undertake here. So I, I couldn't agree more uh, um, on, on the need for us to stay together as a community and work together through uh, a sort of a coalition of the willing. Um, the one thing that I will pull through to the technical end of things, however, is, is uh, the new notion of information and data analytics and big data. So um, in many ways, counter WMD, CBRNE, whatever you want to say, at the 60,000 foot level is an impressive policy statement. We hate WMD. And that's about as much uh, sort of across the board as you can see, because in Rad Nuke, you detect or interdict. Bio, you typically detect or treat. And in Chem, there are different reasons why you would want to detect. Sadly, in many instances, it's to clean up. But that doesn't mean that there isn't an integrative force across the base. The biggest thing is, in many ways, we're not a big data industry. We're actually a small data industry. We don't regularly have rad nuke coming across our border for malicious use. We don't regularly have pathogens being released to harm our people, thank God, and on and on. But as you start thinking through what is available to us to integrate those missions, it is the notion that bad people do bad things. So to have the ability to do network analysis, as uh, Jim mentioned, uh, to, you know, look at the footprints, look at the pathways that uh, uh, these transnational organizations, people who typically want to do us harm do. From an organized perspective, um, the information analytics, I think, is the thing that holds us all together and uh, allows us to have, even though you have different sensors, uh, different reasons to detect, different ways to detect, uh, uh, different ways to respond, uh, the information will hold it together. So how do, we, how do we make sure that this information is getting shared to the point where it's not just a, a DHS function looking at their port of the data, DOD looking at theirs, energy maybe at theirs. How, how, we've talked about relationships. I know early on that's, there was a lot of consensus building. Um, I'm obviously very focused on the nuclear side, 
But that's how we saw that evolve because we didn't come together in, in some kumbaya moment and say, okay, we're all going to work together. It was a challenge um, to getting, getting folks to, to come together, um, even, even though it states somewhat clearly in the, in the law what folks are supposed to do. Um, how, do how do we ensure that, that, that that's our path forward? Well, I think that we've seen a, a growth in the number of integrated councils where we have the interagency working groups working at things, but we also still have challenges with it too that we're still very much learning about. We have title authorities that are different among the different departments. We have folks who are very ingrained in this is what I do and this is my rice bowl, if you will, and I'm going to protect that information and only share it nominally. And a lot of it, I would say, fortunately and unfortunately, has been built on those personal relationships. It's not that, oh, we know that we need to work with this organization, but it's built on the ground level from, I know this person because I've worked with them in the past, so I'm going to call that person and then we'll set up meetings. And where the work is now, and I think we're finding success, but it's slow sometimes, is building that into a lasting infrastructure so that the relationship becomes not just the personal relationship, but the organizational relationship that can withstand the loss of some of those people who are at that personal level. But when it comes to information sharing, it's not just about knowing the people, it's also about does my data work with your system that's trying to ingest that data and use it in your models? Have I gathered it in the right way? And are we sharing the information necessary to make sure we can do that up front? And we're still learning how to do that effectively as well. I mean, as you said, the data analytics is a huge and evolving field globally, and we are sitting here doing some of it, but I think that's somewhere that there's so much more being done external to the government than internal to the government that we're just trying to figure out how we can best leverage the tools that may be out there. And we're, we're not there yet. We haven't figured out all of it yet, but we're working on it. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say 10 years ago, I led a team for the Army's capabilities-based analysis for forensics. And we talked about what we really need to have is the body of knowledge. You can have the compartments and whoever has the right access can access the right piece, but there needs to be some foundational underlying unmanned fusion software kind of you know analytics running behind it. This was in 2008 uh, that we said this, and so it's 2000 what? Um, yeah, we all aspire to it, and, and I don't know that we're a whole lot closer, at least to the parts that I can see. So Kerry, you're right. It was not at all easy at the start. Um, uh, bringing together uh, this, this interagency construct that was DNDO in some ways was very difficult because we pulled people away from their parent organizations, we took money away from parent organizations, and we established an organization that did not really have that much authority other than convening power. Tremendous responsibility, but very little authority. And I want to say that over time, these relationships uh, we built trust. Uh, people came to see that DNDA wasn't just going to run out and take your money and tell you what to do with it. Um, um, so time, time builds trust, working together on important missions, solving difficult things together. Um, nothing worked better to bring us together than the budget crunch, I'll tell you that. Um, we, 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 we had to fight for each other. We had to fight for the mission. Uh, DNDO was called in to defend DOE's SLD budget. We went to OMB with that analysis. We went to the Hill with the analysis. Um, it, it really did help. Uh, the forensics community actually led the way tremendously with their budget crosscut. Um, I'm going to steal this from uh, my, my friend Patch down there. Um, you want to you wanna fight together? You better train together. That's something we did a lot. We, we exercised together. So you didn't come to know each other for the first time in the Fukushima incident. We'd known each other before. We'd worked together. Uh, I think that helps a lot. It ha again, it helps to build trust. And then more than anything, it helps to have champions. Because there is a, a certain sense of reluctance to come together. So in leadership, when you see champions for the collaborative effort, uh, CBP and DNDO headbutted for a very long time until Kevin McAlean came back and he's one of my dearest friends. It was much, much easier to work with CBP after the two leaders set the, set the trend for how things will happen for two organizations. So in some ways, it, it has to become institutional. 
because we're all going to live in this world someday. Um, but it's important that uh, uh, we, we use all the personal connections along the way to build the institutional trust. So, keying off of that, uh, R&D. So, probably one of the, obviously the foundations of, of this program in this area. Uh, we've got major R&D office here with us. Um, we've got the person who sets the requirements for the operational mission. Uh, and then we've got what what is coming out, as, uh, as Jim said, we DNDO is unique in that it has the title authority to do all levels of R&D all the way through life cycle. CWMD, WMD analysis is not DOD specific, it's not DHS specific. This is a program that's cross-cutting. So how, how do we ensure that the R&D that we're doing is answering the broader mission and we're not just very narrowly focused um, on our particular aspect of this so that we're, again, coalescing as a, as a community on this program? To some end, I feel like a broken record here, but that is where we're going to these interagency working groups and collaboration groups to try to do that. And hitting on the, the budget constraint points, there's only so much money. This mission space is bigger than the money that we have available to address it. Um, that, that has always been the case. I, I suspect it will always be the case. It's a dynamic world. Things are always evolving. So there are always bad people out there trying to find new ways to do harm. And we're trying to figure out how to counter the existing ways we know about, think about the things that we don't yet know about and what may be coming. So we are trying to collaborate to figure out, okay, we need to work on detection systems. You need to work on detection systems. How can we leverage this? How can we maybe parse it so that you're working on a piece of it, we're working on a different piece and we're sharing? Or maybe we say, you've got this and we're gonna trust you to pick that up and we're going to do this other piece of it that we'll then give to you because there, there's too much work to be done. Now, that's a very idealized version of it, though, because it doesn't always work that you way. You want to throw the budget process into that, too? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I suspect that everyone in this room is intimately familiar with the uh, trials and tribulations of the budget process, and I sat through it. I was actually on Capitol Hill when we were establishing DHS, so um, watching that process, the authorities process, the budget process, it's, it's a process. It's another, it's another issue with this collaboration because you have no control over, you think you've got a program and you're working down a path and all of a sudden the Pentagon comes down and says, no, we're shifting priorities. I, I don't even think it's the Pentagon. Usually well, it's, it's, you're not getting a budget yeah, so. this year. <laughs> I want to put Carl May on the spot. That's okay. Uh, so just quickly about requirements then. Um, it would help if we all thought about the problem in a similar way. Uh, so, so a wrong answer is going to a trade show and seeing a detector that says, I can do this job in four minutes. Well, that's my threshold requirement then. No. Your requirement is, should be backward traced from the decisions, the type of decisions and timelines you need to make those decisions. So what are you really trying to achieve, accomplish? It's not what the best in breed, you might not need the best in breed, but you need to kind of reverse engineer buying the, the decision maker, the space and time to make adequate decisions is, is the end state and getting there, you know, describing requirements in those terms would be a lot, a lot more helpful than everybody trying to build the latest and greatest or, or the fastest, because that may not be it. And it needs to be looked at in terms of other complementary capabilities, capability sets. It's not enough to have the best detector if it doesn't talk to anything, or if I don't have the decision support tools, if I don't have the common operating picture. Um, did I really need the, the vaccine when I have a 12-day a, a, a window for a therapeutic that is really, really effective and I got a great logistics system? So you, just, you need to think about the problem in a, in a, in a bigger way. And I agree, we'll, we'll try to communicate it. But thinking about it from backward planning from the type of decision and, and your timeline for making it would be a lot more helpful for us. So, so when it comes to R&D, and, and first and foremost, R&D exists because the warfighter exists, because the law enforcement community exists, because we, we, we do work to operationalize it, right? Um, but if you do it right, there is a healthy, healthy tension between tech push and tech pull. 
And um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, over the horizon things. Um, one of the things I, I think the DOD does very well in, in, some, uh, in certain parts of uh, the threat space is, is uh, uh, what used to be the Office of Net Assessments. I think it still exists, right? Mm -hmm. so, so forecasting where the wars of the future will be and how does our United States government get ready for it. Um, if you looked at, at, at Sterling's presentation, I hope that she was sufficiently alarmed because we don't have the time to do any kind of that kind of net assessment thinking. Yet that has to be done at a certain level to drive future R&D requirements. Um, when you live in an organization like DHS, you, operate, you are an operating agency. 250,000, there's about like three nerds, okay? So they have to have a voice to be able to support the future needs of that, that workforce. But unfortunately, the present operational condition and the budget constraints usually hamper the ability of the decision makers to hold seed corn precious. I think that's what DNDO had uniquely. The ability to f sort of wall off future research, fall, wall off R&D that would result in, in capabilities 10 years down the line. And we've seen that happen. Um, if you don't have strong leadership like Amanda and, and places in, in, in Ditra who will invest in that future, you're going to be caught flat-footed and I bet you 10 bucks you'll be sitting in a PC where the Secretary of Homeland Security will turn to you and say, well, Huban, where the heck is that CT scanner? And you're going to want so much to say, but sir, we didn't invest in it 10 years ago. And that can't happen, not in this world. Can I jump in on that real quick? You said something about tech push and tech pull. Uh, so, so tech pull, we have this linear left to right process. We need to be able to do this. The, you know, the, we know how we're going to fight, we think, and, and here are my gaps, and I need material solutions. We do a fairly decent job at, at that. On the, the tech push can't be you know, the, the, the lobbyist kind of you know, version of tech push. Tech push needs to be the cutting edge of science and then the way to link it into the, to the user community. And we're, I'm pretty excited about some of the things that we did before I, I left DITRA. Uh, we've got young Marine warrant officer uh, advanced courses and young Army office, you know, warrant officer and, and officer advanced courses, Air Force, uh, you know, civil engineer courses that among other populations that if you think you, we, we have a cutting edge science, we need, the, we need to plug it into the user community to validate some of these things, to define the requirement, right concepts of operations, concept of employments, uh, because <coughs> tech push can't be the relationship in the beltway, uh, you know, method of pushing. No, I'd agree with that. And that's one of the areas that we're always trying to improve upon is do we understand how the things that we're developing can be used by the end user community? Do we understand what they're really looking for? If we're not engaging in that level of inquiry with them, that we're not sitting down and saying, what is it you're actually trying to accomplish? How are you actually going to use this tool, this capability? We are in danger of saying, okay, we understand what you need and we'll go away and three years later, here you go, we brought you something and say, this isn't what I need at all. And so it's, it's trying to make sure that we're giving them what they need, both when they're saying, I have a need and this is the need, and then also when we're developing something that is informed by the Office of Net Assessment forecasting, that's informed by the tech forecasting, the threat forecasting, the intelligence that's available to us and saying this is where the state of the art is going, this is where the enemy is going, so we need to be looking that way, but we have to stay integrated, as Thamer was just saying. And, and keep asking why. Oh, we have a standoff biodetector. Well, it's really, really hard to do, you know, to aim a beam of something at a cloud far, far away and get a lot of, you know, well, we're going to spend millions and do this. Why, why, why? Well, because I don't want to have to be there. Oh, that's a different problem set. I can launch a sensor. I can do, I can do all kinds of other things. I don't have to have the beam from a box where you're standing just as long as you don't have to be there. So why? Yeah, when, the, when the operating community and the technical community sort of live in each other's worlds this much, it's the right answer. Because the, there's nothing that can replace a ride along for a scientist. And there's nothing, when, when we turned some of Patch's guys into chi-squared fit readers, we knew we'd made a difference. So uh, uh, they, it, it, it can happen. So that, 
And we've talked about tech push, tech pull. Um, so, and you've hit on something I was trying to get around to, but you, you, thank you for walking right into it. But it is that partnership. The, there's the government, there's academia, there's industry. You, you hit on something that's a really big challenge, though, is how do we get folks like Patches people, my people, in to, to understand what your problem is? Because half the time, I, I really think that that's, that's the first step in solving the problem is immersing the people who could solve the problem into the problem set with the warfighter, perhaps, so they're, they're not in some false, fake laboratory environment that really doesn't make sense, but understanding what the, what the, you know, the airman or the, the marine is really running into out there in the field or the problem our CBP agents are hitting at the border. How, what's, how do we bridge that gap? How do we make it more efficient? What would help the work? So that's a little bit back to some of the acquisition reform, uh, and I think it's getting easier to do uh, the, some of the, the consortia that, that exist. Um, the ability to have an open communication with the user community across a broad, uh, you know, partnership of industry, academia, uh, you know, that's that's I think a key to success uh, because when we release uh, an RFP, a, a, you know, a request for a proposal. That's the result of some JSIDS guy who was writing a requirements document that was then also, while he was writing the document, trying to really reverse engineer something maybe he had in mind. It's just this whole horrible, you know, propagating process. But what the, what, what the industry sees is, I, I think this is what they want, but I'm not sure. Uh, could somebody help explain why? We'll keep asking why until you get to the requirement. And then which ones of these things are more important than the others? And having a communicate, having the consortia is, is and I, I'll bet Mr. Bryce talks about this in a little bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll shut up about about that part of it. But being able to to, to talk across open. an industry day, kind yeah, of, uh, well, but a better yes. one than we've been able to have in the past. I think just where you are able to ask the question and explain what it is we're looking for, because sometimes w w I think we've all been guilty of prescribing the solution to those who are going to help develop the solution for us, as opposed to describing the problem. So, so I don't know if DNDO still does this, but back in the day, we alternated our industry days. We did, uh, f uh, one year we would do near-term requirements, and then uh, the next year we would do long-term requirements. And uh, um, what we always had was a panel of users. And that's where, Colonel, we always got a lot of questions, but why? But why? And, and the, uh, the developers found it tremendously useful to speak to the people who would actually use the equipment they were building. So that was one good practice we, we, we thought really worked well. And then what we did was we established a DASIS. Do not ask me to spell the acronym, I have long forgotten. Um, but essentially what it was, was the ability for any industry partner to send in a request to a particular uh, uh, email box, and we at DNDO would look at the request and parse it out to the right part of DNDO. So if, it, if, if we needed long-term R&D engagement, we would have our TAR guys, a transformational applied research guys, take the call or lead the meeting. If it was a more mature technology, we would give it to our product acquisition group. Sometimes they wanted to talk to our operators, so we would bring them in. Sometimes they wanted to talk to our operational support guys, so we would make sure that the training folk were involved. And, and those meetings, the one-on-ones with the vendors, in a, cons you know, so in a prescribed environment, allowing everybody who wanted to come visit with us to email in and come on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You can come in every day. Uh, um, I, I think there was a cadence set up for how often we would visit with you. But I think that helped also. And I can't tell you how much that helped build the trust between the user community and the provider community. Good. So are there, that's an excellent best practice, I think. Are there, are there other best practices that you could share with us that, that might help us accelerate? Um, the R&D and accelerate this, this path forward to, to, to kind of make sure we're on that path to success? And ask Mr. Bryce about OTA. Uh, I'll bet he talks about it. That's, that's, that's one. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's probably a lot of, of best practices. And that's a really interesting one when we have BAAs and service calls and all these other kind of things that we do to, to gather, um, gather the, the responses. I, I, think, I think a lot of it's going to start with our 
our own little community being able to really describe what it is we meant and why uh, that would that would help you a, a lot as well and then we can have all the consortia th that we want and really get after it but yeah. yeah and i think it's also incumbent upon us on our side to be looking at all of the evolution in the tech development community as well so you know looking at the accelerators that are out there and trying to target uh, either startups, small businesses, or just non-traditional partners in that regard. Uh, that's something that across DOD, certainly, we've been leveraging a lot more and trying to get involved there. You've seen things like DIUX, but you've also just seen a lot of entities help sponsor um, an accelerator program, for example, to get after a problem. And it's interesting because it gets at a lot of folks who haven't been participating in DOD research before and they may do it and say, I never want to do that again. <laughs> or they may do it and say, hey, that was pretty cool, and I like that mission, and I want to get behind helping out with that mission. So it's, it's a good tool for us to explore. And I think we have to try to stay open to those things. But as Thamer mentioned, the acquisition rules and regulations are, are not necessarily keeping pace with the way business is changing. So we're we're working through how we can interact in those things. But there is acquisition reform that's happening as well. So it's always changing. So, so the tension between the operator wanting something yesterday and the scientist wanting to give you something in 10 years is palpable. Um, I think nothing worked better for us than when our technical program managers started doing ride-alongs with uh, um, uh, cops, uh, other law enforcement uh, guys, because they began to see their day-to-day -day urgency. Um, but that having been said, you have to have patience with some of the science. Uh, you cannot schedule invention. You cannot rush it. Um, so t again, it, it, it depends. It, it, it really falls on the shoulders of leadership to be able to manage and maintain a portfolio that is at once responsive. You have to be relevant. Um, but then, then does what is needed to, to, to wait for the R&D to mature while keeping a close eye on how the community is evolving. Good. Well, we've got a few minutes left, so I think maybe now would be a good time to open it up to the audience if we have some questions. Uh, again, please remember, um, raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you. And uh, you have one there? OK. Hello, my name is Alan Arnold. I work for the, uh, I'm the Director of Research Development for the uh, MSI STEM Research and Development Consortium. Um, <laughs> one of the problems that uh, the MSIs have, HBCUs, et cetera, is they want to solve the problems for the DOD. And we have a cooperative agreement with DOD, the vehicle, but we don't have the relationships that uh, with all the DOD. So how do we develop the relationships quickly to respond to all the needs that DOD has? Besides, so, I need your all your business cards. There's <laughs> your start. Yeah. So, so that actually is a start. Um, the other thing I'll say is I was actually in a meeting about that yesterday. So it is something that we do talk about and do think about, it, whether it's the MSI community or other communities, but how are we reaching out to engage with folks who want to be part of the solution? Because I think there are a lot of people who are interested in this mission space and want to be part of the solution. For MSIs especially, there are a couple of initiatives that require everyone who has a basic research program, for example, to have a strategy for inter integration outreach. And there are also just broad, how do we increase STEM opportunities in MSIs, for example. So DITRA has a strategy. We were actually discussing yesterday the fact that we need to overhaul the strategy because we're overhauling our basic research program administration, as an example. But I think that some of the outreach efforts that we're making, where it may not have anything to do with the research and development community per se, but if DOD is coming and doing recruiting there, go meet the recruiters and say, hey, you know, I realize you may be recruiting for program analysts or financial analysts or something like that, but do you do any research and development? I've got some students who are in the engineering school or in this area that are interested, could they talk to somebody there? Is there someone you can connect me with? It's trying to build those relationships too. And we have, within our agency, and I know that all the DOD research organizations have someone as well who is a program manager who's looking at how we do that type of engagement. But could we always be doing better? Absolutely. 
um, because it becomes a, you know, we have a variety of efforts. DITRA doesn't just do research and development. We do research and development. We do operations and we do inspections. And we've got an HR function that's doing recruitment efforts. And I'm not sure that we're integrating all of our efforts as efficiently as we could to make better outreach efforts. But um, I'm glad you brought it up because it is something we're thinking about too. So I'll look forward to chatting with you a bit. I'll give you my business card and defer to Hubon. <laughs> I don't work with the DOD. <laughs> yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Amr al I'm the CEO of Noblis. Uh, what role do you see, or what, what has been your experience with data challenges and uh, kind of competitions and things like that uh, in accelerating um, findings, uh, especially in areas of big data, analytics, and algorithmic uh, advancements and things like that? <laughs> well, um, so so when when I was uh, more intimately uh, involved in this community, I, I used to tongue in cheek say that we don't have a big data problem; we have a small data problem. But that actually is a big data problem if you think about it, because our needle is hidden in other needles. Um, what places like JIDA have been able to do is to do network analysis again looking for networks to, using good guy networks to take down bad guy networks. And I think that's going to be the difference. Um, if you think about all the portal monitors we've deployed all around the world, if you think about all the radiation detectors that, are, that Jim mentioned deployed across the United States, um, the one thing that we could never replicate were the instincts of the law enforcement officer, the instincts of the warfighter. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. All the ones and zeros in the world will never replace, as Sterling said, just looking at it through his microscope and saying, whoops, that doesn't look right. What a cop does walking every day on the beat is knows instantly what doesn't fit. Getting that into, getting that somehow digitized, I, I don't know an answer to that. And I think that's going to be constantly the challenge because um, I do remember Brit busting up uh, um, a, a gas smuggling ring using a radiation portal monitor on the George Washington Bridge. Had nothing to do with the radiation portal monitor. Every day the guy would just try to cross as many lanes over so he could get as far from the cop as possible. Eventually the cop figured this out, waited for him at the last uh, lane, and that was it. What did it have to do with the radiation portal monitor? Absolutely nothing other than the visible defense in depth, the visible uh, detector tied with a cop. Those kinds of things I don't know how to do just using data. And I, I'll add on to that. We also have that type of information from a lot of different resources because the network analysis that we're trying to do as we're trying to build a more integrated approach to countering these networks, it's not just the smuggling, it's the finances too. It's the communications, it's the people movement as well as the material movement. It's the, the brains behind the operation as well as the people on the ground who may be doing stuff. And looking at all of those pieces requires this huge integration and getting back to the type of data, we may have data on pieces of it, but it may be that we're talking to the Department of Commerce about some information that they have and how are we sharing that information in ways that are meaningful and able to be ingested and used effectively across those lines. So we have the how your data is collected and stored challenges as well. So it, it, it is a big problem. I think our, our brains are wired to be anomaly and change detectors anyway. That's what we're really good at as human beings. So pairing with the big data and the analytics that, that is also working on that same problem, I, I think is absolutely the, the way to go. Time for one more, maybe? You brought up an interesting issue, though, but also the title, uh, title authority is, is, is another area that we're going to have to address as we get into data sharing um, and how we share our commerce data with our law enforcement data, with our intelligence data, perhaps. And this is a big challenge that, that uh, I think our government's going to have to figure out how to deal with in an appropriate manner. Think of everything that would come out in the investigation later, and could we have done it now? Yes, yep. yes, yes. And, and I, I think the one thing when you say authority, it's not just data authority. I think the one thing that helped on the nuclear side is early on, first of all, I think of, of all the three 
lines, uh, it is the easiest, in a sense. There is no good reason anybody should be walking around with a hunk of plutonium. <laughs> but there could be good reasons why somebody's walking around with a vial of some sort of biological sample, right? And so, the, in many ways, there are, it's much easier to do the nuclear stuff, but we also had a whole nuclear enterprise. We had authorities, we had responsibilities, we were able to pull them together. I think the one challenge the bio world is facing right now is, is that lack of singular belly button. And candidly, I think the nation, you know, the, the world is most vulnerable to bio-strategic surprise. Um, um, and, and so for that reason, everything we've learned and our best practices, and as Colonel said, if something happens, what would we wish we'd done? Let's do it now. Well, thank you all. We're out of time. So we'll...